Our first session this morning, as you'd know from the program, is uh, a bit of a, a look at where we're up to in terms of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Um, as, as indicated, it's uh, about three years now since the plan was signed off and legislated. Um, we've had those arrangements in place. There's a range of measures underway and uh, three years is probably an appropriate time to have a look at what's happened and what progress has been made and what lessons have been learned. And we have three uh, very well qualified speakers to talk on that subject. Uh, the way we will operate, we'll get each of the speakers to do their presentation and then we'll have um, a panel at the end where we can have questions. So we won't have uh, questions or discussion at the end of each presentation. We'll do it um, as, a, as a panel at the end. Uh, that tends to work a bit better. So our first speaker uh, is Colin Muse, who's the Acting Executive Director, Environmental Management Division of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. Uh, Colin joined the Murray-Darling Basin Authority in 2014. Uh, the division is responsible for environmental water planning and management, ecological monitoring and evaluation, and for providing ecological science and model-based advice to support the implementation of the Basin Plan. Before joining the MDBA, Colin was involved in managing the water recovery program in the Commonwealth Department of the Environment. He also has considerable experience in natural resource management issues from his time with ABARES. So please welcome our first speaker for the panel this morning, Colin Muse. Thanks, Pete. Good morning, everyone. Three years in, it's, it's a bit of an ominous thought because it's, I don't know about you, but it's flown past for us. Uh, three years ago, uh, we all celebrated kind of the passing of the, the plan in the parliament, uh, the floor of the parliament, 95.5. And uh, it was a cause of celebration, um, certainly within the authority uh, and, and within government. But three years on, it's um, flown by and uh, we always said we were in a seven-year transition period to implementation and we we're almost halfway through it, so it's a bit scary. If you want to take one thing away from today's presentation, I'll give you the message straight up. The Basin Plan's in place, implementation's underway, and we're already seeing some good results. It's not that the Basin Plan kind of immediately took effect. There was a lot of implementation from the time it was passed through to 2019 when it will take full effect. And in fact, with some of the recovery programs, those investments won't be completed until 2024. But implementation is well underway. I'm going to delve a little bit deeper today into what the Basin Plan is and its breadth. It often gets overlooked. And I'd like to finish uh, with some thoughts about what has to be done in coming years. The Water Act of 2007 kind of built on almost two decades of water reform in Australia. Now, that wasn't kind of the, the arrival of something new. The principles that the Water Act was built on are actually go all the way back to things like uh, COAG 1994 and National Water Initiative in 2004 as well. So those principles that were kind of embodied in those early documents were further enshrined in the Water Act. So it wasn't that much new really in water reform in Australia. But the Basin Plan was one of the key instruments for its implementation. Its foundations are actually much stronger and broader than most people acknowledge or are aware of, um, and in some quarters they're probably reluctant to admit it. Um, I'm happy to kind of field questions on it. I'm not going to focus on this in the presentation, but uh, there is a lot of work that's gone into it. Uh, I actually, for the uh, purposes of time management, took it out of this presentation um, in the end, and I've replaced it with something else, but I'm happy to field questions on it uh, later if you wish. As I said, we've got a, a very long Basin Plan implementation timeline. It's an extended seven-year transition period before the SDLs will file the sustainable diversion limits will finally come into effect in 2019. I just want to reflect, though, and just remind everyone, the Basin Plan actually was significantly revised from the time the draft was tabled in uh, late 2011 to when it was finalised in late 2012. 
many of those new additions were actually in response to the re, uh, feedback from stakeholders and state governments about what they wanted in a basin plan and what they thought would work. Most of them went to addressing some of the socio-economic concerns around the basin plan. So the seven-year extended transition period was part of that. There was also a commitment to review the basin plan settings in the northern basin after a further investment by the authority in better, in better understanding of environmental science, water needs, in socio-economic impacts, and that reviews, I'll talk to that in a second. The SDL adjustment mechanism was introduced as well. Now this is, I'm not even going to try and explain how the, the, the ins and outs of the adjustment mechanism, Marlene's smiling because she knows why. It's a devilishly complex thing, but just say it like this, we've got an opportunity to look at projects which will, which will make environmental watering more efficient, and to the extent that we can do that, we can leave more water available for irrigation. So that's on the kind of environmental watering side. There's also constraints and some further investment and efficiency measures in there as well. But in summary, the mechanism will give us almost like it's a mid-term review point where we can add a lot more flexibility into the plan in terms of how we go about implementation. Uh, finally, there's also a commitment to do 30 further groundwater reviews as part of the plan and they were to be done in the early years. As is often the case, <coughs> um, some federal money greased the wheels. At the time the Basin Plan was being finalised, there was a real turn move to prioritise infrastructure investment. Buyback money was set aside to fund those environmental works. Funds were locked away to fund future projects around constraints and efficiency measures. So uh, people might be more familiar with efficiency measures of that 450 gigs of additional water if we can get it without any social, adverse social and economic impacts. But all those funds were squirrelled away and locked into a special account so that there was a strong commitment to uh, those kind of initiatives. And then it all came together. The Basin Plan were, uh, were, had these features added to it. It was put on the floor of the Parliament and it passed with bipartisan support and the support of the Basin States. So, how are we going? Well, there's been fairly substantial progress with environmental water recovery already. Now, you might get a little concerned by the size of the yellow wedge, which is the, really the, the recovery that remains. But when you take into account the fact that some of those uh, projects to improve the efficiency of environmental watering and some remaining funds for infrastructure investment can get a little bit more water, that might give you maybe four or five hundred or so, maybe a little bit more. So all up, you might be with, with left with as little as 200 gigalitres to go. Now, this is pretty important because that will operate well within the, the um, legislated 1,500 gigalitre cap on buybacks. So, you know, uh, I'll talk about the uh, um, adjustment mechanism in a second, but, you know, much of that recovery work's been done, the lion's share of it, certainly. But if you think that the Basin Plan is just about water recovery, then I think you're taking a far too narrow view. There's a whole heap of other things which I want to step through now, which actually, I think, lay uh, a stronger foundation for water resource management and the irrigation activities within the Basin well into the future. The water market rules came into effect last year. The aim of the water market rules is to add transparency and facilitate the operation of an effect efficient and effective water market in the Basin. It aims to give participants access to better information as well. And I think with that, there'll be greater use of the water market based on temporary sense as well as permanent entitlements. One of the most notable changes coming out of these early reforms is that 4% uh, that, uh, limit on uh, out-of-region trade in Victoria has been removed. And I'll say it was, it, was a, it was a long time coming and it should have been done earlier, but it's been done now. This is slide I uh, had to add, so I've dropped out the science stuff. I don't think there's anyone here who'd be aware of the strong El Nino that, that's currently in place and the prospects of a really dry kind of late summer, autumn, winter uh, next year. Now, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that it rains on the day that I put this slide in. But um, I've checked the Bureau's forecast and it's going to clear up by Friday. So on Saturday, if I was giving this presentation, everyone would go, yeah, right, I, I remember this now. Anyway, so if you looked at it, actually, that, sorry, just as a diversion altogether, 
the little colour there in South East Australia is actually where the rain's going to happen in this next rain event, but anyway, there's the irony. We have, uh, though, very low allocations right now. I don't think this rain event's going to actually pr provide the salvation that everyone's desperately looking for. So we still have the prospects of a dry season coming ahead. If we have a strong El Nino and well below average rainfall, we're going to face very, very low water availability going into next irrigation season. OK, it's a bit of a sobering thought, but why are we better placed now with the basin plan than we were previously to deal with that kind of scenario? In short, the basin plan was never going to prevent the next drought, but it's going to put us in a better position to cope with it. And it's going to come from a couple of angles. Firstly, the planning for our storages is based now on a much more extreme set of low inflows. So we won't be in a situation where the states actually make water allocation announcements and then end up promising water that they don't have and can't deliver. That has to be good for uh, entitlement holders and, and the confidence of the market. Carryover has been more, uh, more widely used now than ever before, and carryover in Victoria was actually introduced after the last big uh, drought event. Now, irrigators and the environment and water holders are using carryover just as much as the other one. Okay? I think this is a great feature to add into the market. It gives flexibility for all concerned, and it'll actually, the importance of carryover might really be highlighted this year when we go into a really dry season next year. Uh, water trading has certainly become less restricted, more transparent. That's what I spoke about before. And the government's investments in making irrigation systems more efficient are certainly helping sustain irrigation output during a year of low availability. And of course, from an environmental perspective, the plans uh, and the early environmental watering has been done on the back of the water recovery has enabled us to, to put some resilience in those environmental assets so they can survive through these dry times until they get their next big drink. So I think we're better prepared for it than before. In terms of uh, looking forward some of these reviews, um, I'll just quickly touch on the Northern Basin Review. It's well underway. We've got projects in place. We've got um, many of these things being done in partnership with the state governments. We have uh, some early results that are just coming through. And the work that is probably in place and has already um, kind of starting to, like I said, generate results, falls into those key threes, three key themes across the middle of the slide. We aim to put an uh, integrated analysis of the outcomes of these kind of new investments in knowledge to the authority in mid-2016. So you can imagine that I'm starting to get pretty nervous by the, by the ticking of the clock. There's a lot to be done, and we have to kind of synthesise all that ecological information, socioeconomic understanding, and re-put it back to the authority members to say, look, have we got the settings in the Northern Basin right? So that's uh, to be done by middle of next year. There's a lot of community consultation that's gone on already in the north. Uh, we started out broad, then as the programs got going, we narrowed it back into our Northern Basin Advisory Committee members, some of the peak groups, but I think the next phase we'll have to go back out broad now to, to actually let people uh, more uh, wider set of stakeholders know about this work. SDL adjustment mechanism. Like I said, it was incorporated into the Basin Plan at the request of Basin States. It's a really important part of the Basin Plan and its implementation. And it's a key way that we're going to be able to uh, enhance the environmental, the social and the economic outcomes from the Basin Plan. Basin Governments recently commissioned a stock take of the SDL adjustment potential. So this is how much can the SDLs move in result uh, if we put all these projects in place. And the conclusion was by these independent consultants that there was a 500 gigalitre adjustment was plausible. Now we'll put that into the context of 2750, which is the reduction amount in total. That's a fair chunk. And also put it in the context of that yellow wedge that was on the earlier slide. That in, uh, indeed is a large chunk of that. So. You know, I think it um, offers great prospects provided all the proposals are finalised and the projects are all of good quality. And, and that's the kicker. There's a lot to be done to finalise those projects. Uh, we released a constraints management strategy back in 2013. That was a 10-year strategy to guide the work, future work of basic governments. The states, with the support of the NWBA, NWBA, are now investigating constraint relaxation projects which will also be put on the table in mid-2016 to be uh, considered. Now, 
the states are leading those projects, and like I said, it's with the support of the MWA staff and the expertise that we have and the knowledge we have and the modelling expertise and so forth. But it will be a decision based on states if they want to table a project they want to proceed with. And the Commonwealth's also preparing the Efficiency Measures Program, the 450 gigalitres that I talked about before, and that's going to provide additional water provided there is no adverse social and economic impacts. I think some of the um, early uh, thinking around the design of that program was released, uh, if not this week, it was uh, end of last week. So some of that information is just starting to come, up, come out. Now, all this work's progressing well, but um, Gavin and I were talking about this before. The, the, that mid-June deadline of next year is seemingly rushing up at us. And three and a half years ago, it didn't seem it was, it was so far away, with, you know, no stress. I tell you, there's a bit of stress now. Um, it's, it is... I don't know, the, the, the clock is spinning around so quickly, it's quite scary for us, and I'm sure it is for all the other stakeholders in the basin. Within this whole framework, try again, there we go. The MDBA's role actually is uh, not as large as you might think. The states are looking at the projects themselves, they're building the business cases, they're doing that for both environmental works as well as constraints. It's the MDBA's role to come up with an assessment framework to determine, righto, when these projects are finished and they're tabled and selected, how much do we adjust the SDLs by? So we've actually uh, come up with a, a model-based assessment framework, and that sounds pretty scary because it's model-based and no one understands models. And I'll even admit to that entirely. <laughs> I don't entirely understand the models, but we've put it into a modelling framework. And it involves an environmental equivalence test that test is there to ensure that when we adjust the SDLs for these environmental works projects, you can get the same basin plan outcomes, environmental outcomes, that you could with the adjusted SDL. Now, that's written into the basin plan, so that's a requirement for us. So we've done this assessment framework. It was fairly contentious, I must say. There was a lot of work done with the states and with uh, various stakeholder groups, but we've developed the methodology, we've trialled the methodology, we've tested it, and it's passed the test, it's been deemed fit for purpose, and it's deemed to be robust. We have had uh, in a lot of scrutiny over it by an independent panel. Um, I think this is one of the most uh, scrutinised pieces of work that the authority's done, and it's passed uh, with, with flying colours, so to speak. It's a fairly glowing quote there from the independent review panel on the slide. With groundwater, I'll just move a bit quicker now. With groundwater, the state's also requested a review of three uh, groundwater SDLs and these have all been completed. Um, we're now consulting with the states about the process for and the timing of amending the basin plan to reflect those new uh, reviews, the outcomes of the reviews, but it looks more likely that those uh, re amendments will come through in 2016. On moving to the environmental side, the basin plan actually provides the framework for whole of basin management of water resources, and re that's regardless of catchment and state boundaries. The basin-wide environmental watering strategy was released in 2014. We've often been criticised that we don't know what outcomes we're expecting from the basin plan. I want to say it quite clearly, that's false. We do know what outcomes we're expecting, what environmental outcomes we're expecting. That's been documented now in this basin environmental watering strategy. It takes a whole of basin perspective. It presents quantified environmental outcomes expected from the plan and outlines how governments and communities can, can work together to achieve them. It's comp the strategy then is complemented by a statement of annual priorities, annual environmental watering priorities, which is meant to guide the um, use of the environmental water that's been recovered so that we get basin scale outcomes and not just local outcomes with no consideration of the broader system. The list of priorities are released at the beginning of each year. The water holders around the basin then use that to guide their decisions. And we actually have convened now a committee of water holders the, uh, who hold water in the southern basin in through the uh, connected River Murray system so that we can actually coordinate the activities of water holders and get the best outcomes we can get with the water we've got available. And that sounds like the kind of cooperative action that stakeholders expect from us. So I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. 2013-14, uh, the last full completed year, 98% of the water, the environmental water that was delivered in the basin was aimed at those annual uh, basin scale, annual priorities of that year. So I think, I think the processes have been set up and they're working pretty well. The outcomes, like I said, 
are detailed in the strategy and they cover things like flows and connectivity, uh, water birds, fish, native veg uh, floodplain vegetation. But the improvement of the outcomes aren't going to be expected to be seen straight away. What we really see in the first few years, we're probably going to see a stabilisation of condition before we start to see that lagged environmental response kick back in. And that we, ha we think that'll happen over the next, say, three to five years. By the end of the decade, we should have seen a, some strong basin scale response. Um, we have monitoring and evaluation arrangements all in place to try and pick up this signal and report back to everybody in terms of the, the outcomes we've got from the water that's been recovered. That degree of transparency and accountability has been a strong message that I was getting when I was with the department, now I'm with the authority, and it is there in spades. People expect us to give, be accountable for the water we've got, and we're making sure that we've got all the things in place to do that. Some of the early signs are really quite promising. Um, we've got examples where floodplain water, floodplains were watered uh, uh, during the drought, and they were then able, when water returned to the system, they were then able to rebound better than the areas that didn't receive, receive uh, that kind of maintenance watering. Environmental watering's been able to maintain core vegetation habitat for water birds through the basin, through uh, the Guaida wetlands, the Macquarie marshes, the lower Lachlan, down into the Hatter Lakes. Uh, we've seen some excellent breeding outcomes for some of our native fish, such as Murray cod, golden perch, silver perch, and some of those kind of outcomes are being further supplemented by the uh, completion of the Hume, to sea, the Hume to the Sea fishway, which is actually further helping kind of the spread or the repopulation of the maintenance of our native fish populations. On the socioeconomic front, this is kind of me putting my head in the lion's mouth, really. We often get accused of not knowing what the socioeconomic impacts are. Um, let me reassure you that we're well aware from the people I talk to that irrigation businesses and communities out there in the basin right now are doing it pretty tough. They're under pressure on a number of fronts. They've got a dry seasonal outlook. They've got low allocations, and that means some hard choices having to be made within some irrigation businesses and also within communities. At the same time, we've got some major returns, some returns for major irrigation crops on the rise. Now, that's, that's a positive. That's good. But it's, again, it's a major source of change for some of the regions. Um, and furthermore, just to reflect that the kind of extent of that change, the one for me, the real kind of kicker, is the spread of cotton. You know, the emergence of a whole new broadacre irrigated activity into the southern basin, and it's just changing the, the uh, operating environment for irrigation businesses in the basin. This is all being played out in the water market, of course. Low allocations, supply dries up, strong demand drives prices up. It's not unexpected. But in amongst all of those kind of change dynamics and water market dynamics rests the basin plan. And I'm not going to stand here and say it's had no impact. But what I'm going to say is its impact is clouded in amongst all those other things that are happening within the basin. Our challenge is to try and tease apart all those other drivers, the impact of the basin plan from all those other drivers. And we think we're getting some way towards it. But we're principally doing it by good local conversations with communities and business leaders within communities, because they know their, their region. When you actually have a conversation with them, they can actually start to tease these things apart. Um, however, though, the purpose of this slide is really to so, show that actually, you know what, there is some major investment happening in the, in the basin. It's really picking up. Um, it's not just uh, within the irrigated sector. There's other investments going in regional communities which are not related to, to irrigated activity. So, you know, it's quite a bit of a mixed bag. I think some areas are doing okay, some areas not so much. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be uh, a real challenge for us to report back to it back to everybody about how we see the basin plan figuring in all that greater mix of drivers and change. Finally, looking forward, and I hope I've stayed to time, but we've got, uh, we've got a basin plan, true, but we haven't really landed the basin plan. We haven't really finalised it. Why is that? Because we've got some major com uh, review points that we're just about to approach. These reviews, both in the northern basin as, as well as the SDL adjustment mechanism, they need to be completed and the adjustments made next year. There's a heck of a lot of work to do to get those uh, proposals set, determine the adjustment amount, get out and do the right consultation, and then complete the, the, make the amendments to the basin plan. 
heck of a lot of work. Then that'll lay then the foundation for the preparation of water resource plans within each of the water resource areas within the basin by the, by the states. And they'll do that in a way which is consistent then with the basin plan settings. Uh, anyone who's been involved in water resource planning before will know that's an enormous task. And I'm, I'm pretty sure my colleagues in the states are well aware of that. We need to continue with our basin scale approach to environmental watering and continue to learn. We've, we've got to make sure the right co planning, coordination and management arrangements are in place. And we also need, most crucially, to monitor, evaluate and report back. All of that information then can feed into subsequent reviews of the basin plan. It might sound cliched, but this is actually a real exercise, a real world example of adaptive management. This is not a set and forget. This will be a set, learn, adapt, learn again. So um, I think that's a real challenge for us in terms of implementation. Implementation is an ongoing exercise. It, it's not just out to 2019 finish. You know, we need to actually actively manage the environmental water and then feed that information we gather from that back into future reviews of the plan. But the Basin Plan and the Associated Water um, Reform Package constitutes possibly one of the largest structural adjustment packages this nation's ever seen. It's the focus of the MDBA and I think our partner governments in the Basin to make sure that the benefits of these reforms are realised because without it we won't get the long-term health and sustainability of the river system needed to support Basin, basin communities. Thank you for your time this morning. I look forward to the discussion after the uh, other speakers. Thank you.